Good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Anderson, and I'm the secretary of the CAC 1A Foundation. Welcome to our first grant presentation for today. We are actually going to be hearing um, from Dr. Christopher Gomez first, who in coordination with Dr. Henry Colecraft is the recipient of one of the CAC 1A Foundation's $50,000 research grants. Dr. Gomez is an expert in the field of neurogenetic disorders, gait and balance disorders, and the diagnosis and treatment of patients with ataxias at the University of Chicago, where he established the Ataxia Center in 2006. He has served on the Medical and Research Advisory Board of the National Ataxia Foundation since 1991, and we are so uh, grateful for him to also be part of the cac one Foundation Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. We're very grateful for his support and his work. Um, we are going to go ahead and turn it over to him, Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Carolyn, uh, and, uh, and, and thank you for the, the entire uh, foundation. Uh, for organizing this amazing uh, patient uh, and physician focused session. Um, I, I've told many people, and I think I've told several of you this, I have been part of many foundations and I have never seen uh, one get up and started what, like, a, like a rocket like this uh, uh, as, as, as efficiently. It reminds me of uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, trip last week. Uh, very impressive. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of it. Thank you also for changing the order of it so I can uh, get up to the airport in time since I'm, I'm actually flying home to the West Coast today. Uh, so I'll just uh, start up right, in, right away. And uh, I've tried to make this uh, talk as uh, focused as possible on, on, uh, on patient uh, understandable uh, 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 graphs and, and slides. Uh, and uh, where I can't, where I haven't been able to make that clear, I'll, I hope I can uh, explain it with answering questions. This work, of course, was in, has been and will continue to be inspired and informed by the experiences I've had with uh, many of my patients, in particular the little ones who, who really kind of changed our focus at exactly the same time that we were discovering something in the lab that I think makes a lot of difference and why, why I think this is kind of a perfect match so I just grabbed these three of the many uh, kids who are experiencing this wonderful uh, uh, development uh, with, the, with the foundation uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from the webpage this morning. Um, so uh, I'm gonna begin by giving some, some background. Uh, there's a lot of history. Uh, in, the, in the 10 years from 1990, of the 91st 1990s, I was beginning my career as assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. And at that time, several key events occurred uh, sort of in tandem with the Human Genome Project and the, the improvements of molecular cloning, molecular biology. Uh, in 1991, the first calcium channel, uh, PQ type calcium channel was cloned from rat brain. That way, that means they had the sequence of the calcium channel alpha 1A protein for the first time. Very soon after that, they found the location of the human calcium channel gene, which was then at that time then labeled CACNA1A. It was located <coughs> on chromosome 19. Uh, once that happened, that empowered linkage studies that allowed some of the early linkage analysis geneticists to identify the location and identify uh, the EA2 gene, the, EA, the, the gene for EA2 and FHM both to be due to the CACNA1A gene in 1996. And the following year, surprisingly, in my opinion, they found that the SCA6 gene was also due, was also the CACNA1A gene due to different kinds of mutations. And that right away led to a, a flurry of, of, of hypotheses and insights uh, because we, at that time, our, we knew, the only thing we knew about the CACNA1A gene was that it, it produced the protein alpha-1A, a calcium channel protein, whose entire role we thought at that time was to allow calcium to enter into the nerve to facilitate neuromuscular transmission and uh, uh, synaptic, uh, sorry, synaptic transmission in the neuromuscular junction and elsewhere, and also to, uh, to control uh, uh, neuronal excitability. So the focus at that time was entirely on the role of alpha-1A protein in the pre and postsynaptic uh, calcium signaling for synaptic transmission. And that led us to form all kinds of uh, hypotheses and insights. Um, by around that time, I began giving talks and I wanted to try to characterize for the audience 
the quandary and interest and, and, and confusion that we have with the differing phenotypes of these distinct disorders. And so I describe them as overlap syndromes of the CACNA1A gene, uh, reflecting in this graph, in this, in this figure, that EA2 patients have some overlap with SCA6 and with FHM, and uh, FHM patients have some overlap with EA2 and SCA6, and uh, try to reflect the fact that these were the same gene uh, caused with, with different mutations causing distinct phenotypes. Um, it wasn't too long after that when I had to modify my figure quite a bit when additional uh, 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 patients were discovered with different mutations that were associated with even more complex uh, clinical syndromes that you all uh, have known about with cognitive impairment, autism, epilepsy, coma, and encephalopathy. Uh, and sometimes these are also overlapping, as we've just heard from, uh, from Allison. Uh, so this was, we believed, essentially due to the fact that there are all kinds of different mutations in this calcium channel protein. So this is a very commonly seen figure of the calcium channel protein alpha-1A, and I'm just going to go over a little bit to make sure that you understand what we're trying to display here with some, some quick figure uh, assists. So these are on the right-hand side are some of the many clinical syndromes that are attributed to different mutations in this protein. This protein is shown here as weaving through the membrane, extracellular and intracellular, uh, uh, six times and then four times uh, repeated. This really is a spread out version of the channel. And the mutations that I'm not gonna go into are reflected as predicted all around this channel. Uh, to make it easier for you, I formed it this way so you can see what I mean. These are the four repeat domains here. And so the mutations are occurring all throughout these, these pie chunks here or in these loops that are here where the calcium is going through the channel of the cell. So going back to that, these four repeat domains form the channel and there are mutations that have been discovered all throughout here. That some of them change the amino acid, some of them change the splicing of the protein, some of them uh, stop the protein from being produced, and some of them, as you know, occur down and way down in the, in the, end, in the end of the protein where the, the C-terminus is. The dogma started to form due to expression of these proteins, these channels in cells, that the, you could explain most of this by the fact that some of them were gain of function mutations and some were loss of function mutations. What does that mean? Gain of function is a simplistic way of saying it favors too much calcium entering through the mutant channels, either due to the fact, as Henry Colcroft could easily explain if he were on this session, they cause the channel to be too leaky or open too easily or to stay partially open or stay open too long. And loss of function uh, mutations were believed to be those that were made the channel too hard to open or uh, it uh, didn't open well enough. And that was the, uh, the dogma for explaining things, which may be much or all of the explanation of why these variations are happening. But we felt uh, all along that this was just too simple an answer for uh, just Two, two behaviors of this channel protein. So it occurred in my lab that we published in 2006, something that we thought could really help explain some of this, uh, some of this confusion. And that is that we discovered a new protein. That new protein is called alpha-1-A-C-T. And we named it for that because it's at the, it's at the C terminus of the alpha-1-A channel. And you can see here in green, it's in the C terminus. We found this protein was actually separate at times in the cell and present in the nucleus of the cell, not as a channel, but as a separate protein. We didn't know how it got there. We didn't know how it was produced when I published this paper in 2006. And in fact, what we said was incorrect. We said it was cleaved by a protease that chopped off the protein at the C-terminus, which many other proteins had been known to be, do to be, to be uh, having happened to them in other settings. So we use that as a simple explanation. So at that time, I left the University of Minnesota and moved to the University of Chicago and took quite a while to try to come up with the answer for this. And in 2013, we uh, confirmed that in fact, this protein is made by an entirely unexpected mechanism. This protein is made by what's called a second cistron. A cistron is a protein coding unit. So each gene has, was said to have only one single cistron to make one single protein. And what we found was that CACNA1A encodes two proteins. It encodes the calcium channel alpha-1A, and it encodes a separate protein, alpha-1ACT. And we found in this early paper 
that it was a, a critical protein responsible for cerebellar development, and it contained the mutation when it's mutated uh, to cause SCA6. We published that uh, 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 in, in uh, 2013. I should say right now that much of this work is done by the le lab, the leader of my lab named Xiao Fei Du, who uh, we really had a great time proving this point. It was very, very challenging, but we, uh, we confirmed that alpha-1 ACT was a transcription factor, a protein responsible for activating other genes by binding to them and turning them on. Okay, and this is a summary of some of that work. Uh, done in, in graphic uh, with pictures. So the cactin 1A gene has about 47 exons. And if the messenger RNA made from those 47 exons spliced together, and you know about messenger RNAs now because much of the, many of the uh, uh, COVID vaccines are messenger RNAs also. But this messenger RNA for, from cactin 1A, if it has 47 exons, it forms the full alpha 1A protein that cause the forms in the, in the nerves that makes tra neurotransmitter function happen. But if the alpha one A, if the if the mRNA uh, starts making the protein way down in exon forty and skips exons one through thirty nine, makes a separate protein which we've named alpha one ACT, built of about seven exons of protein, and it has to and it can only do that if this other sequence made up for between exons 30 and 40 are present. This sequence of the mRNA is called an iris, an internal ribosomal entry site. And I'll go into a little that a little bit more later. This needs to be present in order to produce alpha-1 ACT. Alpha-1 ACT shown in green here is a normal transcription factor that binds to gene targets like these three genes we're indicating here, but many, many others. And they mediate development of Purkinje neurons and other neurons. And in the case of SCA6, which this was focused on, if it's mutated and there's an expansion of a group of glutamines that are present in alpha-1 ACT, if it's mutated, it's toxic and does not facilitate uh, uh, development of Purkinje neurons with, it, with their dendrite ar arbor. So here's an even better graphic demonstration of what we think is going on. This is an mRNA, just like the one that makes our COVID vaccine uh, protein. Uh, but it's, this is the one for alpha-1A. One alpha one the ribosome binds to the front of the mRNA and makes uh, the alpha-1A protein, which as you know, forms this channel of the 47 exons of protein and makes it to a, a, a functioning calcium channel proteins. But the ribosome can also bind to the iris and make a separate protein, which we've labeled alpha-1ACT and it for facilitates expression of the Purkinje, uh, of Purkinje neurons by binding to different genes. So <clears throat> when we started this work and all these developments began to occur, we asked two major questions uh, that I'm gonna talk about now that really I think explain why we think this is so important. Most of the talk is gonna be on question one and the last two, two or three slides will be on question two, which really relate to the, 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 the grant from the foundation. What is the function of alpha-1 ACT? What as a transcription factor is it, does it do in normal brain development? And secondly, how does alpha-1 ACT relate to the functioning of the alpha-1A channel, which we believe there is a, a tight integration. So we knew early on that this was gonna be an important uh, question because there are so many papers popping up by many people, including Elsa, who is obviously uh, uh, in, the, in the foundation's uh, steering committee and Elizabeth Tournier, uh, who are reporting very uh, evolving phenotypes that we were recognizing due to strong interruptions of the function of the presence of this gene with, uh, with congenital ataxias and developmental disorders and a, a whole wide array of things that, that to us made us feel as if this couldn't be simply due to an irregularity of the channel opening and closing. It had to be more involved in the, in the process. So to, uh, this is a very long story that I'm gonna try to make short. We published a paper a couple of years ago in which we show that alpha-1 ACT is essential for survival and for early cerebral programming in a very tight neonatal window in mice. This is again a paper uh, that uh, Xiaofei Du led in our group. And uh, to get there, I have to go through a, little, a few complex slides I'm gonna to try to explain to you. We took advantage of a few other uh, results to develop a very sp specific mouse. Uh, we started out with a mouse developed by Huda Zogby and Kei Watase. 
And this is a very complex site. I'm just going to focus you on, on what she was doing and what we got out of that. They wanted to engineer a human exon 47 into the mouse genome in place of the mouse exon 47. And so they did that. And um, it turns out that the CACNA1A gene makes multiple calcium channel mRNAs. It's kind of uh, the analogy would be if you had a, a movie that you had two or three different endings in it, there are two, two, or three, two or three different scenes that you switched out in the movie, but it was basically a, a, a movie. Let's say, for example, in Apocalypse Now, at one point, Colonel Kurtz does not get killed, and instead he goes back to Hollywood and becomes a famous, a famous colonel instead of a, gets uh, killed by, uh, by Martin Sheen. That would be a different ending to the Apocalypse Now. In this situation, there are different types of mRNAs, and we knew that the MP1 mRNA, the MP1 splice form, was the only one that could make the alpha-1 ACT protein. The others were missing it. So this is a very dominant splice form in our calcium, in our CACNA1A gene uh, transcripts. And what happened in Huda Zogby's paper, which she didn't emphasize, was that the MP1 mRNA was dramatically reduced in the normal mouse. This is a normal SCA6 control. And MP1 is five times reduced. So right off the bat, these mice had five times reduced alpha-1 ACT. And we had a very hard time, we were on this paper, detecting alpha-1 ACT in these mice. Now they were almost normal. So we knew we had to go further. So we developed another experiment. We bred these mice, these, we call them knock-in mice or key, key mice that had reduced alpha-1 ACT and they reduced alpha-1A. We bred them with knockout mice to make an even more reduced mouse. We, made, we bred them with the CO, the KO, which had absent alpha-1A and alpha-1-ACT. And these mice don't survive beyond two, two or three weeks of in the litter. And what resulted was a Kiko mouse, just merging Ki and Ko. And those mice had one null allele from the, from the knockout and one humanized Cactin-1A allele. And that resulted in a, uh, a very useful mouse for us to study the importance of these two proteins. And here's the actual raw data that we were showing. The Kiko mouse had a dramatically reduced MP1 splice form. You can see there with the, in the, the darkest green bar in the Kiko and the, and, and the alpha-1A protein in the Western blot compared to the left, just to the left of it is a normal mouse alpha-1A protein. There's a dramatic reduction, which we quantitated here. You can see how much lower the, key, the Kiko mouse has of alpha-1A protein. So it's missing both, it's, it's reduced in both alpha-1A and alpha-1ACT. And that set us up for a very nice experiment. This is what the mice look like. These are Kiko mice normally in their cage. <clears throat> they have uh, ataxic behavior and dystonic behavior. Remember mice have four legs, so they walk better than humans when they're ataxic, but they have these spells of dystonia, which are another part of Cactin-1A phenotype. After we put this mouse in a 50 cc centrifuge tube for 10 minutes and took it out, this, that little stress caused them to have enormous uh, episodes of dystonia and possibly seizures while they lie there. And this, they recover from that and they're like this. More importantly, these mice, this is only a small fraction of the mice. About 60% about of the mice don't even survive to adulthood. So these are the mice that survive. You have to give them intense nursing and husbandry to get them to survive to this stage. So this is a, a plot of that. These are the Kiko mice in purple. And you can see that about 50% of them only survive to uh, adulthood with, with uh, nurturing. <clears throat> and you can see their, their weight, their growth is very stunted. This is the knockout mouse, which doesn't survive at all. And this is a normal mouse in black. And you can see that the Kiko mice don't survive, don't, don't gain weight very well. And this is actually miscolored their brain, their cerebellum to brain weight is, uh, is reduced compared to control, control mice. So their, their cerebellums don't develop well. So we, we use that as a tool to ask the question, which is the more important protein for this developmental process? So we develop a separate transgenic mouse and that transgenic mouse overexpresses just alpha-1 ACT. So we targeted expression of alpha-1 ACT to the cerebellum and bred a mouse that has extra alpha-1 ACT protein with these mice to ask whether the alpha-1 ACT protein itself was playing a role in this severe neurological phenotype that these Kiko mice have. And right on the slide, you can see what we found. 
the green line shows that we completely rescued these mice, the double transgenic mice, with, we call them Kiko rescue, almost all of them survived to adulthood. You see that their, their, their development of their weight was dramatically improved compared to the, uh, to the Kiko mice, uh, not quite up to normal, but greatly improved. And you can see that their brain, their cerebellum to brain weight also improved. That told us that a large portion of this neurological phenotype that these Kiko mice have was not due to the alpha-1A protein, which we did not enhance. We only enhanced the alpha-1-ACT protein, the transcription factor. And we improved their motor behavior. We improved in their cerebellum, the extension of the dendrites of the cerebellum. We improved the connectivity using electrophysiological studies, and we improved the target gene expression that we knew alpha-1-ACT was responsible for. So here's what the, these mice look like when they've been rescued with the, with the alpha-1-ACT protein. They look basically normal. So this is a, a, a great finding. It told us how important this, regulating this transcription factor must be uh, to the viability of, 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 of us in our cerebellums, or at, least of, at least of mice. So, um, so we wanted it to refine this even more. We wanted to know, now we know that alpha y ct is important, we wanted to know when it was important, at what point in the life of the mouse. So we, we were very fortunate to have developed this mouse under a controllable promoter. So we could turn off this alpha y ct whenever we wanted to. And this Western blot shows you how tightly we could turn it off. On the left is a control Kiko uh, rescue mouse with the alpha y ct protein expressed in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus. You can see how dense this protein signal is. When we give these mice doxycycline, which is the trigger to turn off alpha-1-ACT in these transgenic mice, we can basically ablate the expression of alpha-1-ACT. So we know that we can turn on and turn off alpha-1-ACT in these mice. And then we designed this experiment. <clears throat> we, we turned it off either perinatally uh, be, be at one month before birth and for one month afterwards that we fed the mice, the mothers or the mice doxycycline, or we turned it off at different stages at one month, at three months or at six months of life to know when this protein, this uh, alpha one ct protein was important. And here's what we learned. We learned that perinatally between minus one and one month of life, these, this protein is very important because if you turn it off, you can see that's the dotted green line these mice don't survive uh, as any, well, in any way better than the Kiko mice themselves. So we could blunt the effect of the Kiko rescue and alpha one ct by using doxycycline. <clears throat> and here's their, uh, the, here's their uh, motor behavior. You can see that the dotted green line, they perform just as poorly as the, they, they gain weight just as poorly as the Kiko mice and, and, they, don't, and they don't survive and their ambulatory distance is just as poor as the, the Kiko mice if you get, take away their alpha one ct at birth. But if you take it away at one month, three months, and six months, you can see that increasingly, the impact of alpha one ct is less and less. Here's the dotted line taking it away at, at one month of life. And you can see it's not, as, it's not as good as the rescue, which is in dark green, but it's better than Kiko. Uh, and if you take it away at three months, you can see that it's just a little bit worse than the rescue uh, uh, and uh, much better than Kiko. And if you take it away at six months, it's the same as the rescue. So we know that the impact of this transcription factor protein in cerebellar development seems to be a very transient. Now, this is very important for the SCA6 world because this protein is toxic in SCA6 patients. We want to be able to turn it off later on. Uh, when the patients are adults, but not, uh, not uh, uh, very mature. Uh, but it's also a relevant observation for Cactin 1A children, because we believe that this, the behavior of this alpha one ct protein is being altered uh, by the mutations that they have. So um, <clears throat> this is a, a summary of our, of our cell paper in 2013, showing that it's a transcription factor that uh, uh, is, uh, binds to a number of genes. We just indicate three here that's involved in developing the cerebellum. Um, and, uh, and this is um, the, um, the study of how we looked at this in, in these mice. So what we did was we took these rescue mice and we punched out their Purkinje neuron 
Purkinje neurons with the laser capture microdissection scope. And we looked at the RNA of these mice <clears throat> to look to see how much these genes were being altered by the rescue of alpha-1 ACT. And you can see here in the Kiko mouse, these, all these genes that we were looking at, just labeled with these, with these symbols here, a whole variety of genes that alpha-1 ACT controls, they're all reduced in these mice compared to the control mouse, which is in gray. But if we give the Kiko rescue, if we look at the Kiko rescue mice, whose behavior is rescued by, by giving alpha Y ACT protein, we've greatly increased, sometimes higher than normal, these different genes that turn them on. So we've identified a family of genes that are directly expressed in Purkinje neurons that are, that are turned on and rescued that are co coincident with the rescue of these mice. So this is also relevant to the work that we've, that we've been funded for, for, the, um, for in the foundation. These are human stem cells, and we've expressed alpha-1 ACT in human neuronal precursors, and it shows that it enhances the neurite outgrowth, and again, turns on a whole family of genes <coughs> in these uh, human neuronal precursor cells that are the target genes of alpha-1 ACT. So concomitant with the neuronal-like behavior of these neuronal precursor cells, a whole family of genes are turned on. So I wanted to generalize this for a second to explain the final few slides. This is not just the case for, for the CACNA1A gene. This is a summary, uh, a table of, uh, G, of calcium channel genes made by Bedoud and Lori a number of years ago, discussing the different neurological syndromes caused by different calcium channels. These are, there are 10 different members of the calcium channel gene family. They all have the first beginning CACNA1, and there's a different letter for each of the different ones. So CACNA1A is ours, but there's also CACNA1C and, and CACNA1H and a whole variety of others. And I summarized on the end, the growing evidence that many of these different genes are also bisystronic, meaning they both make a channel and a transcription factor like protein. And I've circled the ones that my graduate student Ishan uh, was working with, uh, and, I'll, and you'll, you'll see why in a moment. He wanted to know how much these channels were, he wanted to know if these other proteins behave the same way, enhanced neuronal development, and if, they, if, if there's integration between the channel function and the transcription factor function. So first he expressed all th three of them. He named them in a symmetric way. There's alpha-1 ACT, alpha-1 CCT made by the cacna one c gene, and alpha-1 HCT. And in all, in all three cases, these proteins enhance the, the neurite out, numbers of neurites that, that neuronal precursor cells from humans had and enhance the length of them. So they truly had an, an enhancing effect to the development of neurons in all three of these new transcription factor cases. So we know these are very important proteins in the, uh, that are co-expressed with the channel in all these gene cases. So to get to question two very quickly, how does alpha-1 ACT relate to the functioning of the alpha-1A channel? So what Ishan did, which was very exciting, he expressed these proteins with a fluorescent tag so he could track them and express them in uh, neurons, in rat neurons, and then he, op he released uh, glutamate to stimulate the neurons. Neurons are stimulated by glutamate, that's the neurotransmitter. And he found three different results. He found in the case of alpha-1 HCT, the least interesting, very little behavior change uh, in alpha-1 HCT. But in, in this measurement of, of translocation, of movement of the different proteins, he found the alpha-1 ACT, the dark blue, left the nucleus of the cell when it received glutamate, glutamate stimulation. And when they increased calcium inside the, the, the uh, neuron, the alpha-1 ACT protein exited the cell over five minutes whereas alpha-1 CTT had the opposite behavior. It entered the cell over five minutes. So he knows now that uh, neurons, neuron stimulation, activating a, of a neuron changes calcium and the, um, and the C-terminal proteins, the transcription factors behave in response to the changing in calcium levels differently in the nucleus. So here's a good example of the raw data Here's alpha-1 ACT, you can see it's fading a little bit over time, whereas alpha-1 CTT is increasing over time when it increases the calcium, and you can plot that on the right. The dark blue line, the higher the amount of calcium, the lower the amount of alpha-1 ACT in the nucleus, whereas alpha-1 CCT, 
which is an, also a, a, a gene produced by a gene associated with many new neuropsychiatric disorders, increases when the, when the calcium goes in. And uh, so this is a quantitation of that. So that sets me up to tell you about our story of, of what we're trying to do with the Cacnawani Foundation grant. So imagine then, this is, the this is our famous channel model showing uh, the calcium channel protein spread out. And this is our alpha one CT protein. And we believe that as the calcium activates, this is our, our calcium version of the, our, our channel version of this protein. As the calcium goes in, the alpha-1 ACT protein goes in and out of the nucleus in response to different amounts of calcium and activates and, in, and stops activating different gene targets over time. Imagine if this is what's happening in a normal calcium channel, what might be happening, I emphasize might because this is only hypothesis, if there's a perturbation in the gating of these channels, making them either so-called gain of function or loss of function, then the difference, the, the amount of activation of this alpha-1 ACT protein and entering the nucleus changes over time. So our, the hypothesis we're testing is gain of function mutations that increase calcium will reduce gene activation and of course translocation by alpha-1 ACT and loss of function mutations that reduce calcium will increase activation by alpha-1 ACT, perhaps to an excessive degree. And so this is our progress so far. Uh, we have one gain of function uh, 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 IPS line and one loss function IPS line that have been established by Henry and me. And uh, we have just obtained one new gain of function uh, line from my clinic actually last week from a patient. Uh, and, he, and he has a stop code on in the early uh, part of the protein. And we also have two gain of function mouse mutants that, that we're going to study. We've already started working on, on one of them. So our, our idea is that the iPS C cells are from normal gain of function, loss of function will make neurons and we'll be able to study alpha YCT signaling, both the neural nucleocytoplasmic ratios, the gene development and the neural development as we differentiate these iPS Cs. So in summary, CACNA1A is a bisystronic gene, two proteins made by one gene. The alpha 1A is a, is a subunit of the PQ voltage gated channel the alpha-1 ACT is a transcription factor, is a second gene product. This protein is essential for survival and cerebellar programming in early life, for regulating a large ensemble of developmentally controlled genes. I only showed you a few. Uh, for orchestrating a network that derives neurogenesis and synaptic plasticity to mediate maturation of Purkinje neurons, and we believe other neurons, and that cac cacnawani mutations may disturb the action of alpha-1 ACT. In some cases, the mutations may occur in the iris, and we're studying those. They may alter the production of alpha-1 ACT. Uh, some, case, some of them may uh, be in key parts of the alpha-1 ACT protein. Uh, SCA6 is an example of that. We have other patients who have mutations uh, in, in a key domains of alpha-1 ACT, such as the AT hook that binds to DNA, and mutations in the alpha-1 in the alpha-1 A channel may disturb the activation and shuttling of the alpha-1 ACT protein to and from the nucleus. So I just like acknowledge Xiao Fei Du, who runs the lab. That's her in the striped shirt here. Shen Fu Wei, who's my chief uh, uh, scientist in the lab. Uh, Daniel Parvez, uh, uh, Parvez Daniel Harjezi Pastor uh, has a great name. And he also is, a, he's at Columbia University in Rockville right now doing an MD PhD. Ishan Rao just did all the calcium shuttling, the calcium and activation and shuttling studies and he just graduated. Jack Godfrey is uh, now uh, finished, he's finished his postdoc. Tyler is a new graduate student. Valerie is uh, one of my uh, undergrads. Uh, and Henry is my great collaborator in, on the Allen channel aspect. And my funding is down below NIH, the, the NORD, the, the Floyd family, CBC, and of course, now cacna1a.org. I hope that uh, I left some time for some questions. That was wonderful, Dr. Gomez. We appreciate all of that information and we are so grateful to the valuable research that you are contributing to our community. Question for you, Dr. Gomez. Uh, if I understand it correctly, um, it was through the use of doxycycline at different life stages to learn the importance of the alpha-1 ACT protein in the neonatal, neonatal period. This really translate potentially into clinical trials in humans. Okay. It still amounts to a fair amount of tail. If, if we were to realize our dream, it still amounts to a fair amount of tailoring of the of the treatments for different types of patients. But in general, uh, 
uh, if we found that um, alpha one ACT wasn't was a problem of, of excess, we could potentially activate the iris to produce more alpha one ACT. Sorry, we block the iris to reduce alpha one ACT, and that's would be using the SCA six therapy to reduce alpha one ACT. If we found that alpha one ACT was produced in a, in a deficient amount, we could activate the iris to increase the amount of alpha one ACT. And finally, if we found that um, that there was too much gating of the channel, too much activation, or too much uh, or too in in a, in amount insufficient amount of activation, we could use calcium channel activating proteins, just like we're envisioning with the calcium channelopathies, to re to enhance the activation of the SCA6 channel and improve the regulation of alpha one ACT by uh, by uh, giving more calcium to the channel. So it's still an amount to tailoring the, um, the, the effect you want on the downstream consequences, either the transcriptive factor itself, improving its expression or uh, improving its triggering by a, a treating the calcium channel itself. Okay, that's definitely helpful. And do you think that the SCA6 therapies will translate to other cac a disorders potentially? Yeah, in the cases, where we want to reduce the amount of the too much story. If SCA6 patients have too much of a bad version of alpha-1 ACT, and uh, in some cases we believe um, CACTA1A um, uh, mutation patients might have too much alpha-1 ACT, then our treatments that we're trying to develop that block uh, alpha-1 ACT by targeting the iris might help those CACTA1A patients. Um, uh, and we also are learning and, and are able to screen for different uh, different microRNAs that can enhance the alpha one ACT expression uh, by activating the, activating the iris more. So when we when we get to that part of the studies, we'll be able to enhance the alpha one ACT expression. Okay, thank you. We do have a question from somebody, uh, one of the attendees, Donna. If you want to go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. So Dr. Gomez, I have two questions. One, if I'm understanding you correctly, if the mutation occurs or the variant occurs in earlier exons, exons before 30, yep. that it would not impact the, um, the manifestation or the, the actual protein itself, but it would potentially cause the dysregulation of the calcium inside and outside the cell, therefore affect how the alpha one ACT travels inside and outside of the nucleus to regulate tran the transcription of other proteins. Is that right. correct? That's, that's, the, that's the extreme version. And, and, and it also could be a combination. In other words, mutations in the channel, of course, are gonna also affect the gating and synaptic transmission. So it could be a combination effect. And that, that we, we feel as if the complexity of that is um, justified by the complexity of what we see in the patient syndromes. But yes, what you're saying is uh, if the mutation is up here above, this is, this is about where exon 30 uh, starts. Actually, exon 30 starts in here. So right. some of the parts of exon 30 actually make channel protein. So let's, let's go way up to sort of the second repeat domain. There are many mutations here. Maybe we go find a... Yeah. Find a, that has to be uh, where my sons is. A good example, <laughs> a good example of that here, because Shafe made a really nice graphic that we stole from Daniela Pietrobon. Um, let's see that one image where here, here it is. No, one more. No, yeah, yeah. So you see yeah. here, these are the, these are the channel only domains, mm -hmm. okay? and down here, this is iris. And this makes channel, and this is pure alpha one ACT. So yes, look at all the mutations that occur in the channel. So mm -hmm. we believe that if our hypothesis is uh, only partially true, these mm -hmm. mutations alter channel gating and disturb things from pure transmission problems, but also disturb the way this guy goes in and out of the nucleus. Okay, and then also potentially from the research that I saw that do had, you could also potentially have the alpha one CCT be upregulated. Well, wow, I, as, I, as, as I was just, as I was relating the other stories, I was thinking, oh my God, I hope no one asks about how those things are integrated. That's a very, it's a very important question. Remember these, but these channels are, 
are dominant in different neurons and different times of the neuronal cycle. But yes, you are right. It is, it is mucho complexo. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree with you. Um, there's some subtleties in that that I didn't want to go into. Uh, uh, Ishan found that if the calcium going through that L-type uh, Cactin-1C channel, that calcium mm -hmm. is what really changes alpha-1 CCT. Um, he, if he looks at alpha-1 ACT or alpha-1 A driven calcium, it doesn't affect, he, he can't block the alpha-1 A channel and disturb CCT's protein very much, but you're still right. This is uh, an entanglement, but that's why these cell lines and these mouse lines are so incredibly important to try to decipher these things. Thank you so much. And then my only other question is, I know you, going back to what Carolyn was talking about, about shutting off using doxycycline to shut off after yeah. development. What about doing the reverse? So Turn for these on. kids, yeah. What about turning it on to see if later, if fixing it or, or yeah. giving them that protein later <laughs> is still going to produce something positive for these right. children who've been... Right starved of it through right. the whole neonatal development right. and, and into childhood. Right. It's a great question. I mean, I can get, there, there's a subtlety I, I glossed over again. There's a lot of glossing that goes on in these stories. Let me try to find this. These patients, these mice, the elf, the Kiko survivor mice, long way through here, get better and better as time goes on. It's an encouragement I give to my patients when I see them that all this environmental enrichment and all these things that they do, where's the good slide of that? Let me see if I can find it. This is an important fact. Yes, it's the next one here. The, the Kiko survivor mice um, get better and better. So, so they, are, they are very, they stop changing at 12 months. Okay, so the ones that we get to survive are very close to them. So that experiment with this particular model is not feasible because these, the Kiko survivor mice look more and more like a normal mouse as time goes on. Again, emphasizing the transient nature of this protein. Now, what, you, what you're saying is right. What we want to do, we want to get some other mutant mice that are still quite neurologically impaired, different kinds of calcium channel mutant mice, and then do it exactly what you're saying. Add the alpha 1 CT, keep it off until later on and see if we can, cor if we can correct them. That's, a, that's another project. It's a, lot, it's a good project. But the Kiko, what, what's amazing about the Kiko survivor mice um, is that they, they stop meeting alpha-1 ACT after 12 months, and they're nearly normal. And the genes that they target have found another way of turning on. Wow. Yeah, do do we have any way of correlating that their development age to the age of a human being? Um, yeah. Uh, Jeff, I actually know, might know that better. But I think, I think that... Uh, Six months must be close to about a 20, 20 year old, something like that. I mean, it's oh, these, wow. these, these dog ears okay. things are kind of weird. Uh, you know, human ears, dog ears, horse ears. I, right. I know, Jeff works with more mice than I do. Maybe he has, he has a question too. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't want to keep you. Yeah. I know other people have questions. Thank you so much. It was, it was fun. Thanks. Thank you for those questions, Donna. Uh, we do have another question from Dr. Nobles. Go ahead, Dr. Nobles. Yes, good morning. Um, and thank you, Chris. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so following on with the complexity issues, which we're all learning to embrace, um, my question is about the transcription uh, patterns and profiles that might be occurring in other cells, not Purkinje cells. Do you think they're the same in other types of cells? Do we have any information on that? <coughs> well, maybe you, I, 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 another gloss over was I targeted, as you probably saw from the paper, I targeted these this protein to the Purkinje neurons, um, but uh, but we are now harvesting other neurons for the Cactin 1C project, uh, and we'll probably be using control neurons to, to look at that. But the alpha 1 ACT knockout, the the the, the Kiko the, the the Kiko knockout is global. You're right, and so there should be other neurons that we should be looking at. And but our but our rescue trench gene was only targeted to the Purkinje neurons, so we couldn't. There wasn't a, a large reason to look at that. But as we as we follow up on Ishan's project, he's his knockout is a Cacna one C knockout in the forebrain, and we'll have Cacna one C data. We we will probably be able to look at the Cacna one A data in, in parallel. Yeah, because I'm imagining you know the possibility of uh, really complex patterns that all come downstream from this uh, abnormal transcription. The other and and you know thinking back to the tottering mouse, one of the early findings. Um, 
in Purkinje cells was this ectopic tyrosine hydroxylase expression that yep. nobody could understand. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that has shown up on your radar yet, or or keep it's, looking for it if it does. It's, it, it's on my radar. It's, it's something that the PI says in a lab meeting a couple of times, and then when people ignore him, they they, they move on. But I've I've been talking about tyrosine hydroxylase and zebrin and zebrin for a long time. I think we did some zebrin a long time ago, but not pre Kiko. I think we did it with the original right. knockout, and when we rescued the original knockout with with alpha one ACT, which you know just caused a few day extension in life and and improvement of the of the climbing fiber input. Um, it wasn't as cool thing. We, I, don't th I think we did not get back to the uh, the zebrin and the tyrosine hydroxylase since then. It's definitely worth doing. Yeah, um, because it's seen in actually more than one allele, uh, and it's in the lethargic mouse too, which is a a, a beta four. Uh, interaction domain um, mutation right. with alpha right. two, so there, you know, it's a complex. But history. importantly, is it looked at? Is is it is it a very non-specific phenomenon? In other words, is it seen in an, a, a non-calcium channel mutant, for example, uh, that would just show this as a non-specific effect, like like just just like climbing fiber withdrawal is a non-specific uh, effect. Yeah, I got you. I don't think it's been extensively looked for, but it's not in all mutant mice, that's for sure. Okay, fine, fair enough. Okay, yeah, a lot yeah. of work to do. Yeah. yeah, good, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Dr. Gomez, for all of that information.